Heller, and I am the Washington correspondent for the Watertown Daily Times in upstate New York along the Canadian border. Sometimes I like to say I'm a reporter in the Washington Bureau of the Watertown Daily Times, <laughs> but of course I'm the only reporter in the Washington Bureau of the Watertown Daily <laughs> Times. Um, uh, those of you who appreciate brevity and speakers will appreciate, uh, appreciate having me here because I don't know <laughs> I don't know much of what to say, but 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 let let me introduce our, our speakers a little bit. Um, this morning, you all heard a little bit about uh, uh, different ideas, what sort of solutions uh, are out there which uh, uh, may work or uh, uh, may not work, and and and, uh, and and that sort of thing. This afternoon, we have something a little bit more maybe nuts and bolts which is how, how do we measure things? How, how do we know whether uh, this solution or that is working? How do we measure very basic things like, um, like, uh, 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 like uh, ju just how these different standards are working at the border and, and travel times and, and things like that so that we know, so we, so we can find out what is working basically. Um, we'll begin with uh, David Davidson, and Catherine Brick Friedman, and although you have their bios, I'll, I'll give you just a little bit of a flavor. Um, David uh, has served as the Associate Director of the Border Policy Research Institute at Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington since 2005. Prior to working at, uh, prior to working at BPRI, he ser served for eight years as the City Administrator in Sumas, Washington, uh, a city abutting the Canadian border. In that capacity, he gained practical experience with border-related issues in arenas such as border security, environmental management, and trade facilitation. Uh, he received a Master of Science degree in Computer Science from the University of Virginia and a Master of Public Administration degree from the University of Washington. Uh, Catherine Brick Friedman has served as Deputy Director of the University of Buffalo Regional Institute since January 2006. In addition to working with the Director on Strategic Planning for the Regional Institute, she directs and leads the region's EDGE, the Institute's binational program. She's a frequent speaker on binational and international issues to both academic and non-academic audiences, briefs policymakers in Canada and the United States on various binational issues, and publishes research on international law and U.S.-Canada relations. In her capacity as Deputy Director, she serves as a lead contact for the university in academic and policy networks, including the Northern Border University Research Consortium, New York State Shared Services Advisory Council, and the Border Net and Lakes Net initiatives of the Canadian federal government. Finally, she directs research, uh, directs research projects related to regional post-industrial economic restructuring. Uh, we'll also hear from Matt Morrison, who is the executive director of the Pacific Northwest Economic Region. That's a public-private partnership established in 1991 by statute in the states of Alaska, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Oregon, and the western Canadian provinces of British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon Territory. As executive director of PNWER, he coordinates all projects, including the Partnership for Regional Infrastructure Security. Pausing for a moment to reflect. <laughs> we also have <clears throat> with us Kathleen Carroll, Director of Government Relations for HID Global, a leading manufacturer of proximity and smart card technologies in the access control industry. Uh, we know about RFID. <clears throat> Carol oversees HID's global radio frequency technology privacy and policy initiatives, including pending legislation in the 50 states. She also works to support public policies that address RF technology and privacy at the national and international levels. She serves as the chairperson of the Security Industry Association State Policy Advocacy Working Group, which is working to educate legislators, business leaders, and consumers about radio frequency technology and its benefits across a spectrum of applications, including identity management, physical and logical access control, food and drug safety, child safety, and patient safety. She also serves as vice chair of Tech America's Identity Management Committee. In addition, she's a member of the Smart Card Alliance's Identity Council. And also has a BA in journalism. <laughs> 
which we like to hear. Tony Shallow uh, is a senior economist at Transport Canada. He first joined Transport Canada in 1982, working consecutively for Airports Group, Canadian Coast Guard, and Policy Group in St. John's, Newfoundland. On transferring to Ontario Region in fall 1995, he was afforded the opportunity to cultivate a specialized functional interest in Canada-U.S. transportation trade corridors and Canada-U.S. gateway management issues. The Border Wait Time Research and Development Project, which is a joint venture partnership with the Bridge and Tunnel Operators uh, Association, the Motor Carrier Industry, and Turnpike Global Technologies, is the latest outgrowth of those efforts. Wait times. We... Uh, we look forward to hearing a little bit about how we measure wait times. And with that, I think I will turn it over to David. Uh, hello, my mic. Good. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here. Two years ago, my institute, the BPRI, began to form a consortium of universities to undertake research related to the Canada-U.S. border. We believed that because of regional variations, universities spread along the breadth of the 49th parallel would be able to provide a more complete understanding of border-related issues. So we formed the Northern Border University Research Cons Consortium, and the University at Buffalo is now our research partner, which is why you see Katie and me giving a joint presentation regarding the border barometer. The barometer has been a collaborative project of our two universities, and although I have to credit Katie with having thought up the idea in the first place. Funding for this project, by the way, came from the BorderNet initiative of the Government of Canada, and we thank you for that. To some people, the border's performance uh, equates to how long they sit waiting in a border lineup. No argument that a traveler's wait time is an important metric. That particular metric is the focus of attention by the federal governments of Canada and the U.S. And here's a screenshot of CBP's existing border wait time website showing the wait times at many of the major crossings. Now this is you know, cadged, obviously. It's not real time. There's an effort underway right now involving CBP, uh, CBSA, Federal Highways, and Transport Canada to develop consistent methodologies of defining and measuring wait times. And when we hear from Tony in a few minutes, we'll learn some of what's going on with respect to how wait times are being measured and being used. But we believe that the border's performance is about more than just the length of the queues, because a border has many functions. Borders are supposed to provide separation between differing jurisdictions. So, for example, the border should help Canada enforce its laws regarding gun ownership by serving as a barrier to the flow of firearms from the U.S. to Canada. But borders are also supposed to connect jurisdictions. Goods of the right kind, uh, manufactured in one country, should be able to move smoothly to the neighboring country. So the concept of the barometer is to develop a set of indicators that provide insight into the characteristics and performance of the Canada-U.S. border. An ideal indicator would be supported by a long-standing data set which would allow a review of performance over time. Uh, the data set would also be available on a port-by-port -port basis which would allow comparison of one region to another. So last uh, November, my institute published an article discussing uh, some ideas of what kinds of metrics would be useful. And there are a few copies of this thing out on the table in the lobby, if anybody would like to pick that up. Some of the metrics mentioned in that article have now been developed further, leading to the border barometer that's uh, available today. And they're scattered all through the tables here. Although you see it now as a print format, we envision the barometer as ultimately being a web-based tool. A lot of figures on these slides come from within that brochure in front of you. So why are we working on this barometer? Well, one theme of the conference is the idea of regional challenges and solutions. We believe the barometer will help find solutions. In any attempt to improve the performance of a system, you have to be able to evaluate baseline conditions to then see what happens as changes are brought online. As I said, the barometer is meant to cover many aspects of the border's performance and many corridors. 
but it's a project in its infancy and we're seeking feedback from possible users, which are folks like you. Today we're going to present some ideas about indicators that relate to porosity of the border, how well it lets things through, as well as infrastructure found at the border. Uh, and first up is porosity, which Katie is going to discuss. Thanks. <clears throat> well, um, I'll give just a, a little bit more background information. Um, in terms of the second iteration of the border barometer building off of BPRI's research, we broadened the scope of the barometer. The uh, original border barometer looked at only one binational region. This border barometer, which again you have in front of you, it's on, on, the, tab on the table, so please feel free to uh, take a copy. Um, the, the border barometer in front of you examines three cross-border regions along the 49th parallel. Now I think the first two are fairly obvious as to why they were chosen. Um, one is the Cascade Gateway, which is where the uh, Border Policy Research Institute is located. The second is the Buffalo Niagara Falls, which is where the University of Buffalo Regional Institute is located. But we also wanted to include the Detroit-Windsor area um, because, as we all know, it represents the largest crossing in terms of trade between Canada and the United States. And I'd just like to uh, emphasize a point that David brought up. In terms of coming up with new indicators of border performance, we began to think about the border as a membrane, a, an, an entity that at times needs to be flexible and fluid and allow passage, while at other times it has to harden in order to prevent passage. And we think that this conceptualization is very, very important because in our view, it's not an either-or situation. This is not a situation of security versus economy. I personally don't believe that is a very constructive dichotomy. I, I don't think it furthers policy dialogue or policy action. I th we conceptualize the border as uh, entailing, as having different goals that call for different measures and hence different indicators of performance. Now, one indicator that we think captures the flexibility and the fluidity of the border is, as David mentioned, porosity. I'm not going to go through every single graph that's presented in the barometer. You can do that at your leisure. Um, but what I do just want to do right now is provide you an overview of the uh, four data sets that were publicly available, and I have to emphasize that um, because we were limited to publicly available data. Uh, we looked at four data sets that we thought captured this notion of porosity. We examined trade flows measured in terms of the per percentage growth and growth in U.S. exports and U.S. imports from Canada. We also looked at mode shares by examining the shares of exports and imports by truck and rail at the three binational border regions. We calculated trade ratios, broke it down region by region, and looked at U.S. export to import ratios for trade with Canada, and then we also looked at vehicle traffic, trucks and personal vehicles as a percentage of motor, motor vehicle crossings for the 1995 to 2007 era, and then traffic growth for trucks, pedestrians, buses, and personal, personal vehicles at each binational crossing for the same time period. Your turn. Oh. <laughs> I, I told you I wouldn't bore you. <laughs> Back to me before I expected. <laughs> uh, when we talk, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about infrastructure. And when we talk about infrastructure, we refer broadly to the processes, the facilities, and the institutions that form the border and administer the border. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to show how different kinds of infrastructure are linked to border lineups. Um, we saw that CBP has a website displaying wait times, but what are the factors that actually cause a lineup? Well, it's those factors that have to be addressed in order to solve the problem. So it's those factors that have to be measured. And the factors are the number of seconds it takes to inspect each vehicle and the number of available booths. Uh, 
So it turns out there isn't very much publicly available data about how long it takes to inspect each vehicle. Um, so here are some data that are from the I-5 corridor, my neck of the woods, for just one point in time. Whoop. There we go. Uh, for just one point in time, Jul July 2007, and these are gross measurements of the average amount of time elapsed between cars getting out of the inspection process. So to solve the problem of the lineups, one possibility is make these numbers smaller. Um, notice that Nexus, the Trusted Traveler program, is much faster, so it emerges as a compelling solution. That makes it worthwhile to think about measuring enrollment in Nexus. And that's what we see in this graph. It shows the growth in enrollment in those three study periods over the past six years. Aside from Nexus, another way to reduce inspection time is to carry an enhanced driver's license. Uh, like the Nexus card, an EDL has an embedded RFID tag that's read by a scanner while the driver is approaching the booth. So that information about a traveler is already displayed in the booth at the time the car arrives. So the customs agent doesn't have to gather documents, swipe them through readers, those kinds of things. So we ought to be measuring the rate of enrollment in EDL programs. And I've put that in the little box there. And it's antiquated already. We got an email from Liz Luce, the Director of Licensing in Washington State, uh, this morning saying that it's 41,154 EDLs in Washington State. It's going along at the rate of about uh, 900 a week right now uh, enrolling in the EDL program in the state of Washington. So my slide's out of date. With respect to the number of available booths, we've proposed using a metric of the ratio of the number of booths to the average traffic load, That's that, as shown on this slide. And it seems, and, and this is in your book for both cars and trucks, it seems as if these ratios bear some semblance to reality. Uh, we know, for instance, that the worst lineups in the Buffalo Niagara region occur at the LQ, the Lewiston-Queenston Bridge. And sure enough, when you look at this slide, that bridge has a relatively low ratio of booth to traffic. That's the 4.8 at the very bottom uh, compared to some of the other ratios. Well, that's all I'll say about facilities and processes, the so-called hard infrastructure. But we also believe that there is a soft in infrastructure that supports uh, performance of the border. And one part of that infrastructure is the network of binational organizations that deal with border issues in a given region. So this morning, Hugh Conroy described to you the IMTC, uh, which has been a huge help facilitating mobility at the I-5 crossings. Um, our conference co-sponsor, Penwer, was instrumental in the development of the Washington, B.C. EDLs, the first in the nation. The existence of these kinds of forums should be measured in some way, and this is a, our attempt in this document. That's the last of the slides showing what's so far been proposed for the barometer. Uh, there are lots of other kinds of metrics that could be included, and I'll end by showing you a couple. Here's a slide, and this is not within the document. Uh, here's a slide showing how regions differ with respect to the kind of commodities that cross the border. And these slides show exports from the U.S. to Canada in October 2007 through Detroit, Champlain, and Holton, Maine. And I took all the two-digit commodity codes and lumped them into five broad categories. You can see the category codes centered under the middle of the three graphs. In Detroit, you see the huge predominance of manufactured goods, while other kinds of commodities appear more significant at other ports. Well, why does this matter? If an inspection process is designed to handle one particular industry sector, it might not work very well at ports where that sector is absent. And this appears to be happening with the FAST program, which is heavily used in Detroit and not used very much elsewhere. Well, there's the final aspect, how well the border functions as a barrier against the bad things out there. And this is an arena where it's hard to come up with region-specific data consistent over a period of years. Uh, the inspection agencies don't routinely publish that data. They provide data at kind of a nationwide level of detail. 
So what might be of interest? Uh, let's look at some stuff published in CBSA's 2005 agency performance report here. Um, 640 firearms seized that year, 320 million of drugs, 97.1 million travelers. Now this is agency-wide, so this is all ports, land, sea, and air, not even specific to the land ports. A billion dollar budget. Well, here are some kinds of metrics that could be developed with those kinds of data. This is just a typical agency productivity headcount kind of thing that might be used for internal management. Uh, but look at it over time. As headcount has climbed over the years, has there been a corresponding climb in interdictions? And CBSA grew from 10,000 odd to almost 14,000 people over a four or five year span. And so with all the extra headcount, what's being accomplished? Um, these kind of metrics out of, again, based on that previous slide, these weighed into the arena of cost-benefit analysis about how much of a particular societal goal is accomplished at the border. A lot of the contraband seized at the border is drugs. So this ratio of three bucks of cost for one dollar of drugs, how might that compare to the ratio that the RCMP uh, is accomplishing in its internal efforts to seize drugs within Canada. So what's, how, what's being accomplished at the border versus away from the border are some things that could be pursued in this kind of exercise. Uh, that gives you a flavor of the idea. Um, I'm going to stop there and turn back over to Katie for the grand finale here. <laughs> and for that grand finale, I'm going to bring you up around 20,000, 30,000 feet, and get us out of the data and start to think about in what are, in my view, or what is, in my view, uh, the critical question with respect to this pilot project and the research that we are undertaking. Right? So what? Why are we doing this? Why does it matter? Both the BPRI and the UB Regional Institute sit, we are housed firmly in the academy, but we still sit at the intersection between the academic and the policy worlds. And in my view, the answer to the so what is a mantra that the director of the Regional Institute, Kate Foster, has uh, said for a number of years now, is that you can't manage what you can't measure. And I understand that we are dealing with a particularly tricky subject, the international border between Canada and the United States. But this pilot project represents a first shot, I think the, the first shot from, you know, as far as I'm aware, at coming up with a comprehensive tool that could start to measure border performance and begin to tell the story of what is going on at the border so that policymakers can respond accordingly. Now, the performance metrics thus far tell a story. There's one theme that we are all very, very familiar with, which is increased Canada-US interdependence. But the metrics also support this idea that regional variation is real. And in my view, regional variation should be taken into account when constructing policies that deal with the, with the international border. The data give us the what. They tell us the what. We now, I think, have to think a little bit about the how. How do we leverage this regional reality in order to achieve greater economic competitiveness. Do we go with more international treaties and a North American community as some have suggested? Or should we craft a governance architecture that provides for strengthened regional networks and flexible federal policies that engage states and, provin states and provinces and that take account of regional variation? 
Just as a master builder uses many tools to build a state-of-the-art home, I submit that policymakers have myriad tools at their disposal in fashioning a North American architecture that enhances our collective competitiveness by addressing the border on a regional basis. Now, I, I don't believe that Washington and Ottawa will fully devolve foreign policymaking <coughs> to the states and provinces. And, and some of this was brought up a little bit this morning um, with the suggestion that a, an international border commission be established. Um, and, and there would be, might be a problem with Ottawa and Washington devolving authority to that kind of institution. However, I do believe that Ottawa and Washington, or Washington now in particular, could allow for participation of U.S. states through a consultative process similar to that that we have in place right now that was promulgated by the NAFTA Implementation Act. This piece of legislation, which was the legislation that was promulgated, as it suggests, to implement, Na implement NAFTA in the United States, includes a provision that states are supposed to be informed and included in trade negotiations that directly affect their interests. So I submit that this could serve as a possible model for including states in policy making that concerns the border and, and, and actually could engage states in a way where each one could represent a particular you know their particular interests based on what is going on in their particular region at any given point in time. Um, other dis other examples of flexible policies have been discussed before, and and I won't get into them. But I do think that consideration of these bigger picture governance issues, and I'm using the term North American governance because that's what I think we're talking about. Consideration of these North American governance issues hinges on, or in fact demands, rigorous data collection and analysis. And that's why we embarked on this pilot project. So I'm going to end right now, but I just want you to consider whether this pilot tool is useful for thinking about U.S. and Canadian competitiveness as we move further down the path in this globalized world of the 21st century. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Catherine and David. Um, just a quick uh, uh, brief interruption from your trusty moderator here who notes that uh, uh, Matt Daly from the, uh, from the Associated Press is down there, and I failed to introduce you, so sorry about that, Matt. But Matt is the uh, Pacific Northwest correspondent for the Associated Press and is going to help uh, facilitate uh, discussion here and ask, uh, and ask some questions, too. So uh, moving right along. Uh, Kathleen. Okay. Uh, thank you all for uh, letting me speak to you today. I'm happy for this opportunity. I only have one slide um, because I'm mainly talking about um, RFID technology and the security and privacy issues associated with it. Um, and so the, the slide basically speaks to no matter what kind of technology you have and how advanced you get with encryption or whatever, you're always going to find somebody who's going to find a way around it. And in this case, it's just a $5 wrench. <laughs> so um, so I, I am a certified information privacy professional. Um, that is my background. So I want to talk to um, some earlier today, some people raised some questions about the technology and, and in particular its use in the enhanced driver's license. And I was very happy to hear that in, in the issuance of the enhanced driver's license, they are following uh, privacy rules in terms of notice, choice, and consent. So for example, in the state of Washington, um, you can opt to have an enhanced driver's license, but you don't have to. Um, and, and the state of Washington is making people well aware of the technology and how it's being used. Um, one of the key things to remember about the enhanced driver's license, and, and I think it's been mentioned earlier too, is that it is using a pointer system. So 
in point of fact, there is no personal data when you approach a border crossing station. No personal data is being uh, transferred from your card to the guard station. What is happening is it's pointing to a database, a secure database, and then populating the screen of the, uh, the border agent so that he can see your personal information. One of the, uh, one of the uh, big things around uh, security and privacy for um, these programs, and, and that includes um, the WITI program where they're issuing a pass card, which uses the exact same technology as the, uh, as the enhanced driver's license. Um, but the goal of WITI was not just proof of citizenship, it was also to um, help the flow of commerce. And so that's why they chose a long-range read RFID technology. Um, and CPB did do a uh, privacy impact assessment before they implemented the technology, which looked at any um, privacy impact that, that this technology might have. Um, the, uh, the pass card and the EDL also contain an MRZ zone so that if the RFID technology is not available, um, the border agent can read the, the MRZ zone to get the information. Um, what it provides to uh, citizens is a safer, hassle-free uh, way to cross the border, um, and uh, it, it basically eliminates boundaries while at the same time maintaining efficiency and security. Some, somebody asked the question earlier, too, um, what are the obstacles about um, broadening this approach with, the, with Washington State and New York now um, to uh, have all the border states um, issue enhanced driver's license. And I can tell you from personal experience, one of the main uh, uh, obstacles is um, the legislation at the state level. I have been for four years now fighting um, legislation at the state level that would ban the use of RFID technology in government issued identity documents. And in some states, there's a sort of schizophrenia going on where you have um, a state uh, a state legislator that has a, a, a proposed ban on the use of the technology, um, but then you have another law uh, being proposed that actually supports issuance of the enhanced driver's license. So it's interesting. A lot of that is driven by a lot of the misperceptions that are out there about the technology. Um, and how it can and can't be used. And so you know, part of, the, uh, part of um, my role um, when I go around and I do testify before state legislators around the country is to, is to do some myth busting, kind of like the Mythbusters show, um, to talk about um, what people seem to think are the, the risks associated with, um, with the, these uh, types of cards. Um, one of the things is people say these cards will, you know, just give out your information no matter what. Well, in, in fact, in point of fact, the enhanced driver's license and the pass card um, only give out a unique number. Um, they only respond when queried by a reader. If someone were to actually be able to get that number, it doesn't give them any information beyond that number on the card. There's no personally identifying information. So if somebody were to try to claim that they could clone that card and then cross the border using that number, that's just not possible because what will happen is is if they make a card and they, they use that number, that number will populate the screen, as I said earlier, and it, there will be a photograph of the person. So unless they know exactly what that person looks like and can be a, a, an identical twin, they're not going to be able to cross the border. Um, some people say, they seem to think that you can be tracked using RFID technology. That is not true. Um, unless there were readers positioned every 10 feet in a city where it could, you know, the, you, you would be con your card would constantly being, be, being read, it, you, you couldn't be tracked. Um, again, um, people think that the government could track you if you have this technology on your person. And again, unless the infrastructure is in place, that's just not possible. Um, some of the some of the key um, issues or you know privacy concerns uh, are come from this idea that, that people think that these tags can be read indiscriminately and that's just not the case. Um, so for for from my perspective, if you want these programs to be extended across the border in all the border states, I think that every state that undertakes to issue an enhanced driver's license should undertake a, a privacy impact assessment before they implement the program, look at where the weaknesses in the system might be, address them up front. 
um, be uh, open and honest with their system, their their citizens, give them notice, provide them with choice, and always um, allow them to to either consent or not consent to um, this uh, kind of technology. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Kathleen. And uh, <clears throat> waiting patiently down there is uh, is uh, Tony who's going. Oh, <laughs> uh, Matt, did you have something you wanted to? <laughs> To contribute uh, now. Now that we now that we have Matt uh, Morrison sitting here, uh, why, why don't you go ahead, Matt? And Thank you. Um, I do have okay. Um, thank you very much, Kathleen. I I, I want to really thank um, David and Don uh, at the Border Policy Research Institute for the um, important work that they've been doing. As uh, has been pointed out. Uh, I think this is a very timely conference, and you know, from um, from the meeting last Thursday, my hope is, is that we can inform this review of the U.S.-Canada border management at, from a regional perspective. Uh, in some of the handouts on the table uh, from Penwer, we've identified about 32 specific, very specific items that we think can and should be fixed before the Olympics in 12 months. Uh, the Border uh, Council that we put together of stakeholders essentially was set up for these reasons. Um, and um, we have uh, attempted to provide consistent input to both federal agencies, and there are issues you know, for both, uh, both governments to address. Um, and we recognize that security uh, must, as has been said many times, uh, be consistent with uh, greater mobility. Um, the, uh, you know, we did play a major role in the EDL, and it was uh, quite an experience. Um, and I think uh, David's pointed out the incredible um, uh, doubling of trade at, at our border ports uh, since NAFTA. And um, we're very anxious to see uh, uh, resources commensurate with uh, the economy and the economic value of trade. Um, the assessment criteria important to our stakeholders really is, you know, the, as Sukumar pointed out, the, uh, what the community, um, the community perception is so important. If, you know, I, I had a meeting with uh, the Vanock uh, executive director, and he said, you know, my greatest nightmare is waking up and imagining that on the evening news is four-hour wait times at the border during the Olympics. That was an amazing thing for, you know, he's got a lot of nightmares to think about, but that, that, I thought that was very telling because uh, there's going to be a lot of people attending the Olympics from, uh, from the U.S., uh, the clarity of documentation has come up again and again with our business um, people and uh, the transparency uh, issues at the border. So these are some of our recommendations. Uh, they're in all of the handouts. Um, and I think that uh, we're uh, hoping to really um, see greater resources go to the kind of metrics and uh, study of, of border performance. Um, I'm very grateful for this border barometer <coughs> effort. It's uh, terrific, and uh, we need that. And it, just in conclusion, uh, it's been brought up before, but uh, trust is, is a local issue, and it, uh, it doesn't happen by accident. And institutional frameworks are really critical in building trust. And um, I put up here, you know, it, it may be the greatest asset we have and should be systematically encouraged and institutionally reinforced. And that's something, as uh, the senator brought up, we really have to look at how do we do that. And uh, the user-friendly, safe, secure, and efficient border crossings is vital for our economic integrated economies and that the 2010 Olympics offer a, a very great opportunity for us to, um, to look at those. So uh, I guess, it, it, you know, in conclusion for me, I've been with Penwer for a long time. 
um, since 1994. And the, the greatest thing I've seen is, is these uh, legislators and governors and premiers um, really establishing very uh, sincere personal relationships over time and the different agencies and committee chairmen having a, a regular place to meet and work progressively on issues. Over 20 years, that has a real impact. And um, we have a lot of catching up to do in other parts of the country because uh, someone pointed out to me, you know, even the federal government doesn't have anything like Penware, where the secretaries and the ministers have a regular place to meet with a, a framework um, to move forward. Uh, and I, I think that's a really interesting comment that we need to think broadly and outside of the box and now, as has been said, is the perfect time to do that with the economy in a tailspin. We can't just relax and be complacent. And uh, we have such an integrated economy, it's vitally important we address this issue and we think outside of the box and we recognize the importance of building trust and institutional relationships. It's, it's vital. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Matt. And uh, we now have uh, Tony Shallow, who's been waiting about 46, 47 minutes no to tell problem. us about wait times. I've been waiting years. <laughs> uh, thanks, Mark. Um, thank you for inviting me here today. It's a real privilege uh, and, our, and an opportunity to share with you some of the work we've been doing in Ontario region. Uh, I really, I really uh, like Mark's uh, original categorization. He said this is strictly a focus on nuts and bolts. My kids would suggest I'm mainly nuts, but uh, <laughs> this is where I live in the nuts and bolts. Um, let me put it this way. Um, uh, I'd suggest that in many strategic and high-profile respects, uh, rationalization and expansion of crossing capacity, for example, you know, Transport Canada's commitment to smarter border management is, is self-evident. Um, but, uh, you know, in more routine matters, um, for example, what gets done at the working level, perhaps not so much. So that's where I'd like to focus today. I'd like you to zoom in the teles your telescopes Focus your attention on one particular project initiative that we've um, embraced in Ontario region. One project that's really only one small part of a much larger picture. Uh, and hopefully in doing that I can demonstrate to you that this commitment to smarter border management has in fact trickled down through the department uh, and that what we try to do, what we've tried to do from the outset is focus upon d delivering tangible products useful intelligence, and visible results. Uh, in a nutshell, for the past three years, we've worked in collaboration with a GPS-based application service provider and the trucking industry to estimate commercial vehicle wait times at Southern Ontario's five major border crossings, uh, using the data elements drawn from the carrier's digital tractor logs. Uh, our objective has been to demonstrate that these tractor logs are an increasingly abundant and economically viable electronic data resource that we can exploit with tangible benefits for both government and industry alike. Now note, uh, to put this another way, I'm not suggesting to you this is the only way to estimate or to measure performance, but it's a new way. It's one new tool. Um, to date, we've compiled in excess of 250,000 crossing observations from the source data logs in a little over two and a half years. And we now, uh, that uh, from a cross section of carriers that is now in excess of 50 Canada and US domiciled carriers. Uh, the overall data sample granted is small, it's but a fraction of total crossing volumes. It actually varies from about one to three percent of total crossing volume by, by crossing. It, it varies from one to the other. We have little control over where a carrier chooses to cross or when they cross. So it's not without statistical limitations. However, this is indeed the first time that the same empirical method has been applied in both directions uh, at all major southern Ontario crossings. Uh, and I think it's, um, its value is a performance metric that, or analytical tool that can complement other related initiatives. It could, for example, 
be feedstock to use that is used to calibrate more automated systems and, and so-called more predictive systems. Or it can be one amongst other indicators that comprises a, the so-called border barometer. Um, I think the key here is that the data is now compiled on a routine day-to-day -day basis at an expanding rate, gratefully. Our observations, despite the turn down in the economy, our observations have continued to grow as the vendor's business continues to grow. Uh, and importantly, every wait time interval that's captured is processed and then posted within three to four minutes of completing the crossing. Not real time, but close. Um, as a result of that, I'd suggest that crossing operators, local port officials, and the carriers themselves can now access crossing time variability. They can do it hourly. They can do it by time of day, by day of week, or as frequently as they might require. Um, I could spend a lot of time setting out the technical and empirical details that we've tried to breathe into this. I could describe to you why GPS data logs are both cost effective and offer a high degree of precision and detail that improves the quality of the estimate. I could talk to you about the geofences we've created around not only the entire border crossing but specific locations so that record stop times and delays within the individual crossings such as duty free. Stop times that are offline times that do or don't reflect unique operational considerations. Or I could review a thousand data charts with you. Fortunately for all of you, I won't. There's no time. <laughs> but I will slow show you a slide or two. I want to put a picture in your mind and hopefully spark your interest in what we've done. But in, in that regard, let me do it in the context of two larger, more fundamental issues that I really think that attest to the value of exploiting this type of new innovative data resource. First and foremost, note that this is a private, public partnership venture. Doesn't involve a lot of money or capital expenditures, but it is nonetheless, in every respect, a public-private partnership that wouldn't have been possible were it not for the trucking industry's willingness to partner with government and provide access to their proprietary data logs to address a problem that clearly affected everybody's mutual interest. <laughs> that all parties have a vested interest in timely, consistent, and empirically reliable data on border wait times is clear, self-evident. What we have simply done is leverage the carrier's onboard technology to calculate the wait time interval and made the results transparent to government, to border management agencies, and the carriers alike. Um, let me illustrate this with a couple of slides. Um, forward here? Okay, just this, if you will, slide one. This is what we have developed as, the, if you call, the visible interface. Uh, it's password protected, but in essence, it is readily accessible to parties with a stated interest. You can see here, it's, it's simply a generic site. Note in particular, that each crossing observation, which is, as I said, recorded within moments of the crossing being completed. In that regard, one technical detail. Essentially, what we have done with the cooperation of the bridge and tunnel operators, who I consider one of our, our principal clients, we have simply located reader devices at the end of the crossing, so that as soon as the crossing is completed, the data is downloaded, it's, it's transmitted via the Internet, it's posted, then it's it's processed and it's posted to this website. That, if nothing else, was a practical accommodation, if you will, to the extent that we could in recognition of the fact that real-time data is vital. The quicker you can get it, the more timely it is, the more value it has. So note, if you will, that each crossing observation has been stripped of all corporate identifiers to protect the proprietary interests of all the carriers. Note also that the interval measure itself to the right here includes perimeter queuing as well as plaza throughput time. Similarly, the interval measure is adjusted, netting out excessive stop time or offline time spent at duty free to give both the crossing operator and the carriers a more precise measure of transit time for benchmarking their own operational and efficiency standards. Uh, I should add in that regard, technically, 
you can geofence secondary. You could net that out. I would suggest here that what we don't, we felt that it was at the outset we had to learn to walk before we could run. But I would suggest that if, uh, in terms of questions that have been asked to me of industry, clearly the most prominent question is, can you delineate secondary? I think the operational significance of that to individual carriers is self-evident, and I'll say no more. Um, carry on. Um, and these are just companion elements to display. You'll notice here essentially a dashboard, which is meant to give you or anybody else who would look at it a quick one-shot snapshot of what's transpired throughout each hour of the respective day. Um, uh, where the web display I just showed you provides a window on current conditions, it's also the starting point to access the archive or the warehouse of data observations that we've compiled to date. Slide two, uh, excuse me, slide three. This will just give you a sense of the kind of analytical products that emerge from the time series data that's stored in the archives. Uh, and I would add that that continue, that begins to resonate with considerably more detail as the total number of observations continue to grow. I just ask you to note, I won't spend time on this, but note if you will, this is Ambassador Bridge US bound, uh, essentially a combination of crossing times relative to total crossing volumes. On the top part of the slide, note if you will, the inverse correlation that exists between crossing times and the number of crossings during the peak morning hours. Uh, if you want to cross at Ambassador Bridge, do it on peak. It's like buying a burger in McDonald's. <laughs> at peak time, you get served quicker. Um, I'd only add that this is not the same type of pattern that's apparent at all crossings. Also note in the bottom slide where I've stripped out the crossing times, you can very, very clearly see in contrast to the pattern that was evident over the prior two years, notice that there has been in the past six months or the, in, in, throughout the 09 or 809 physical year, a very significant decline or smoothing of what was the traditional peak. Um, whereas the, um, uh, let me see, uh, um, with regard to this particular slide, as I said earlier, at the outset of this project, the, uh, the participation and support of industry carriers in the joint venture was based on a dual assurance, one, that we would, there would be no compromising their propriety, the confidentiality of their logs, and two, that they would see tangible benefits in response to their participation. Delivering on that latter assurance, I'd suggest to you, is clearly evident in slide three. And, and this is something that we personally are very proud of because we did manage to pay back for their cooperation. Note here that as crossing observations are posted to the web display I showed you previously, they are simultaneously routed to each carrier's proprietary client records with their own corporate identity and their unit number still intact. So this essentially gives every partner carrier a unique display of their own wait time activity relative to the total number of posted observations. It's in effect, a one view, uh, in effect, these one view border crossing activity reports have now become an integral part or value added component of their service, of the service content that the technology vendor routinely provides its clients. So each carrier can routinely monitor their own crossing activity by driver, unit number, or by crossing and compare their performance to the overall average. So with such empirical data in hand, each carrier is well positioned, excuse me, to take corrective measures when necessary and more importantly, to advocate on their own behalf if and when they feel there is marked variance in their own crossing activity relative to that in the larger sample. Uh, moving on to the second point, um, beyond partnerships, and, and, and that being a novel quality here, an innovative quality to the, to the undertaking. The real bonanza here, if there is anyone, is the inherent value of the e-data resource itself. Traditionally, the dearth of consistent, high quality data on the trucking industry, on transportation system capacity generally, has been the bane of transportation planners 
and traffic managers for years. It's expensive at best, only done on a periodic basis, and whatever quality might be inherent in that, it is rarely ever consistent from one jurisdiction to the next. But consider if we can pull this type of data on border crossings from digital tractor logs, imagine the wealth of data that could be compiled, compiled from the sum total of all trucking activity or trucking activity across corridors or beyond borders. Uh, with the advent of onboard electronic data recorders, the opportunity now exists to readily access specific purpose performance data in volumes and at a per unit cost that was never previously imagined. Excuse me, I've just got to find where I am. <laughs> um, having said that, but the opportunities that lie ahead with regard to harvesting and cultivating these electronic data records, I'd suggest to you that our efforts to date to establish the technical and economic viability of cultivating this resource has caught in two ways. Uh, in the first place, this border wait time application has either opened the door or helped expand the boundaries of other companion efforts to exploit digital tractor logs as a planning and analysis tool for both trade-based as well as urban highway corridors. We're not alone in that work. I'd suggest that much of the seminal work in this regard was done by FHWA in concert with the American Transportation Research, Agency, uh, Research Institute. We happily found each other at about the same time, and, 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 and they have been a great source of support to our work. But at the moment, there are no less than six corridor-focused electronic e-data projects that are currently underway in Ontario and Quebec, all of which that have emerged directly as a consequence of the seminal work done by FHWA and, again, in some small part, the visibility that we have been able to attribute to this line of research in Ontario and Quebec region. In a matter that is somewhat closer at hand for us, we had the good fortune throughout this project to demonstrate a new, a new and equally promising performance metric uh, that hopefully will facilitate, that could in time facilitate estimation of passenger traffic wait times at border crossings. That specifically is to be able to exploit the functionality of Bluetooth technology. Um, I'll conclude quickly, but in essence, Bluetooth, and, and it is not in many respects unlike RFID. It is simply a radio frequency signal. Um, it was at the outset, the particular vendor that we work with, it was a cost, uh, cost control element wherein to offer their carriers a smaller, a, a more modest price point they stripped out the co uh, communication device from their black box, replacing it with a Bluetooth device, which essentially succeeded in downloading and transmitting the data at zero cost through the Internet. That was a rather exotic idea seven, eight years ago when they first started business. But since then, Bluetooth has become the all but ubiquitous standard for all personal communication devices, in dashboard devices, etc. What we have discovered, not altogether fortuitously, but in setting up our system in locating the reader devices at the individual border crossings, we also included Detroit Windsor Tunnel, knowing, of course, that it had very limited commercial vehicle traffic through there. But we quickly discovered that the readers in place are speaking to and logging the, the proper term, I, I believe, Catherine, is discovering. It's essentially a reader. Every Bluetooth device emits a Bluetooth signal and, or a friendly Bluetooth ID. And I'm grateful to Kathleen for having laid out why the RFID signal is essentially anonymous and poses little or no threat, no threat to privacy. It is, 
it is just a signal and and there is no connectivity to personal information so all that's it thank you Kathleen you've saved everybody a lot of time but the point is it sits there as each device that comes within its range emits the signal, it discovers the signal, it reports it, and it's synchronized to a time clock. And then, of course, when it exits and the reader is on the other side, you have the match, you have the ability to uh, de delineate the uh, interval. At, and I, I made the mistake of not including a um, chart from um, Windsor Detroit Tunnel, suffice to say that the number of observations we've been able to compile there because of the ubiquitous nature of, of, of Bluetooth devices exceeds threefold the number of observations that we have been able to c accumulate from any other crossing. Um, in that regard, we're very pleased with the support we've gotten from uh, the bridge and uh, the tunnel operators in Detroit who, who, who use that, who consider Bluetooth a polite and effective interval or performance metric. Um, based on that experience that we've had with Bluetooth at Detroit Windsor Tunnel, there are now a number of complementary projects underway, further exploring the possibility, the potential that exists indeed to utilize Bluetooth as a proxy for passenger traffic, both in at border crossings, at airport sites, and in urban corridors. Essentially, the bottom line is that um, one last part, one last point. I'm sorry, sorry I apologize. Um, quick, uh, I quick, Tony. What I had to say. So uh, I think I'll, I'll end it there. Suffice to say that. Um, it, well, as I said, Bluetooth, in every respect, complements RFID, but offers the added value that where RFID is the installation costs are very little, there is nonetheless the requirement to equip a user population as per the electronic uh, driver, enhanced driver's license. With Bluetooth, the numbers of devices out there continues to grow. We have essentially a captive audience. As long as the Bluetooth device is on, the signal can be captured, can be discovered, it can be reported, and the interval can be measured. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. That's Tony. <laughs> okay, not to make it like the gong show, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, Matthew um, uh, from the Associated Press, I believe, was going to share a thought or two or three and uh, and maybe uh, throw out a couple of questions here and get our brains uh, moving a little bit on our uh, on our questions. Yeah, I was hoping to just you know wrap up a little bit about some of the earlier uh, remarks from the governor and also from some of the other speakers this morning, as well as just asking some questions of the panel here and maybe even just throwing it out to anyone else who was here. I guess one of the things that uh, Congressman Larson mentioned was just you know the idea of uh, having so much you know impact of, of Canada and the United States, the trade that they have, the partnership that they have, that the trust that they have, and I guess this will be, you know, the Olympics will be a great opportunity, and I guess there's some questions about, you know, how, how well that's going to work, and I guess I was hoping some of the uh, speakers here could talk about that in terms of, you know, he, he, he was saying there's going to be at least 250,000 visitors and maybe more, and how do you really prepare for that? And, do you, and I guess, Matt, do you think people are prepared for that on both sides of the border? You want me to answer that? Yes. <laughs> Is Michelle still here? <laughs> um, well, we're, we're certainly doing a yeoman's job, but, you know, we, <clears throat> we were very pained by GSA not being able to keep a schedule of renovating the main border crossing. It's all going to be under construction during the Olympics, so you know that's been a heartburn <laughs> however under construction they're going to have temporary booths open so we're doing i guess the best we can um <clears throat> we th <clears throat> think i guess it would go to the idea of that you mentioned that the uh, sort of the nightmare scenario is the tv yeah. uh station saying you know four hour wait times or three hour wait times or 
really anything more than you know minimal wait times. Well, and I guess what's the likelihood? I think there, there's a high likelihood of, of significant wait times, uh, but but the common sense ideas that 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 are in one of my handouts, like trying to get an advanced passenger manifest for buses, we we you know we're close, but I can't get closure on that one. It's like you know just like an airplane, they would send the manifest to the border, the border would somehow speed up the that bus. Uh, it sounds very doable, but we're not there yet. And those are the kinds of things. There's a lot of things that's the second train that needs to go into Vancouver. Uh, there, there's low-hanging fruit that have that I'm committed to see if we can get done before February 2010. So the answer is is yes and no. <laughs> and then I don't know if I've heard a uh, specific figure mentioned here about. What do you expect the economic impact will be both in Canada and in specifically in the uh, five uh, states that you rep, you know that you kind of cover in terms of the United States, the Pacific Northwest states, the economic impact of the Olympics? Very good question. Uh, we we have that somewhere, and I'm not certain. I, I know I think what BC is is uh, Sukumar. You have that figure probably on on BC, the economic impact of the games. It is. Multiplier try to yeah, analyze the specific multiplier during the period of the games versus the multiplier effect post games. Mm -hmm. um, I think the model that people have looked at, or I should say the models people have looked at, are Sydney and Salt Lake. And in both cases, what happens is that following the initial post games law, or even by drop in the station, both games in about a year or so. Just for BC. And I guess th this is just as someone who lives in the United States, I cover my region. Just so, just to explain what I do, I cover the uh, five uh, Pacific Northwest states. In fact, just exactly that line up. I cover Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and Montana, and their congressional delegations and issues that affect them. And obviously, border security and border crossings is one of the issues, and, and the relationship in general with Canada is, is, is a specific issue. Um, I was telling people at lunch that I covered for many years the uh, dreaded softwood lumber dispute, which uh, luckily has uh, died down a little bit. But um, what I guess I was asking was interested in, in, in Kathleen. You mentioned that the uh, enhanced licenses that they don't really sort of transfer the data, and I guess there's a lot of probably concern out there that they really do transfer the data, or they can that the data can be transferred. I just wonder if you could kind of just sort of slow that down a little bit and explain how it doesn't do that and why someone's fears that that is happening is not right. Sure, that that's an easy one to explain because the chip is only encoded with a unique number, so. The personal information never gets anywhere near the chip. That It's just a number that's on the chip. The personal information resides in protected databases. Um, when, Like I said, when you approach the border crossing and your card is read, it's only a number in the air. There's nothing else in the air, nothing, just a number. And that number does not tell, say anything about uh, whether it's a male or a female, whether your what your uh, racial racial background is, there's no identifying information whatsoever. It is strictly a number. In in the state of Washington, they required uh, a foil pouch that you can put your driver's license in, just for that purpose. Just so that the data would be it's a, it could never be read. Right. Well, okay. it's not that the data uh, can't. Uh, it can't be read. What that uh, foil pouch does is stop that the then nobody can even get the number then. Mm -hmm. So without the foil pouch, you, there's you know a likely or not a likelihood, but a chance that you could get the number. But with the one, one, if you keep it in the foil sleeve, 
you can't get the number. Um, radio frequency does not travel through metal. Um, it's one of the issues that they found at the retail level because they're trying to protect all kinds of products. You're trying to protect a product that has metal in it. You protect it with radio frequency. It doesn't work. Um, so I think one of the big things about the enhanced driver's license has to be um, citizen education. Let people know, and, and, and citizen responsibility too. It's up to the citizen to, we have, a, we have a responsibility to protect our own information. We can't just rely on the government to protect us. We ha it, and, and sometimes it frustrates me, we have to get back to that sense of we have a personal responsibility with, with all of these issues, especially when it comes to personally identifiable information. I guess I had the, my final question was um, something, again, picking up from uh, what Congressman Larson mentioned this morning, and he talked about only 3 percent so far of the tickets that are being, you know, sort of sold are to Americans. And is, do you think the fear of the wait times or fear of crossing, or is it, what, do you, what do you think is behind that, and how do you sort of account for that? What do you do to, to counteract that, I guess? I'll take a stab at that. The 3 percent was an allocation made to the U.S. Olympic Committee to sell right. by the International Olympic Organization. So it had nothing to do with how much demand there might be in America. It had to do with this is what this nation's allocation was. Um, so that 3 percent has been dedicated to be sold to Americans. Um, no one knows. Was it to Washington State, I think? 40 percent of that? Yeah, I heard that 40% of, of that 3% was from Washington State. Alone. Yes, right. But let me go on and say that another aspect is a, a large number, a large percentage was available for Canadians to purchase, uh, and there's a pretty good suspicion that some Canadians might have been purchasing tickets that they'll be passing along to their friends down in the U.S. So, so that there will be uh, other Americans coming who are above and beyond the 3% that was allocated to, to the U.S., do you, think, do you think that was sort of a realistic number, I guess? The 3% sort of surprised me as it seemed a little bit low, just even as an allocation. Well, when you have how many nations, 200-odd, that <laughs> there was just a limit to how many could be allocated to specific nations. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you, Matt. Um, before we move on to questions from the from the room, one of the benefits of being the moderator is you get to ask a question or two. So if I might throw this out to whoever would uh, would like to, to handle it, um, it, it occurs to me that, I mean, we're looking for consistent ways to measure performance and things like that at these, at, at these border crossings. But, but of course, up in my part of the world, up in uh, northern New York, there are different places and different ways to cross the border, um, every place isn't uh, Detroit, Windsor, or or, uh, or Buffalo, or even or even the Thousand Islands. I mean, we can we can cross up at Interstate 81 at the Thousand Islands Bridge, just going in the car to the to the border station, um, and I've done that. You can go to the Mohawk Reservation, and I've done that too, where you walk across the border, and there's a big rock right about over there, and that's how you know. Um, although there's also a border station once again once you get into Canada, but. But it is a it is an unusual uh, place, especially from the perspective of the folks who live on that reservation and are supposed to have free access across the border by treaty. Um, and then the other way that you can cross is by boat. And and of course we have a program up in our part of the world to to do this by recreational boat, where you just uh, get in your boat and maybe it's docked in your backyard and you go across and you uh, check in at the telephone which is how you call the authorities in, in Sackets Harbor, New York, and you basically check in uh, with Homeland Security that way. Go to your restaurant or whatever, and then get in your boat and go home. <laughs> uh, I, I wonder, as you look at all these different measure, measuring factors and things like that, how do you account for the, the differences in, in how people actually get across and, 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 account for, uh, and account for these things, not just commercially, but you know, to the recreational... Uh, 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 traveler. Well, I can certainly, I, I'd be happy to speak to that in one regard. Uh, when I said, con when I said consistent, uh, I, I, I obviously meant consistent within that region that encompasses those five bridges in, in, in southern Ontario. Uh, there, there's, there's a, there's a useful distinction that I, 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 I've grown to appreciate over the years is that 
when you're talking about wait times at border crossings, there's a, there's a presumption on everybody's part that this is a process management issue, that it somehow resides wholly within the, within the confines of, of, of the respective customs agencies or, or port authorities. Uh, frankly, the processing time in the pill and or time, extra time spent in secondary, those are only two elements of what is wait time, that total interval, that, that interval that coincides with the bottleneck or not that the border is, that is a part of useful part of the supply chain, the, the, the discontinuity within the industry supply chain. Frankly, I think measurement of, of wait times at border crossings is not a process management issue. It is a transport or a traffic management issue, and it's incumbent on the transportation agencies to focus attention on the solutions. That said, I would otherwise suggest to you that you know, transportation is inherently a regional initiative that differs from one region to the next by virtue of the volume or the composition of the traffic and the capacity of the roadway. I'm going to take a stab at your question, too, if I could, and uh, just point out that there's this tremendous funneling of the great bulk of cross-border commerce and passenger travel to small numbers of ports. Um, we saw that three ports of entry handle over half of the trade, and uh, the top, there are 121 roads crossing the border, but the top 13 of them um, you know, handle about, I'm sorry, the top 18 of them handle over 80% of the traffic. So I guess part of my answer is, hmm, if we're worried about performance, um, the place where we have the bottlenecks is the place we need to be looking to figure out how bad the bottlenecks are and what to do to solve them. And the person um, going through the very small crossing where there is no wait is not concerned so much about the performance in terms of porosity, in terms of ease of getting across the border. I think that there's kind of an opposite problem there, which is when you think about the, the border that needs to be a barrier, an interdiction of the bad stuff, uh, that's that's a different matter. How do you measure that performance in the Mohawk Reservation where the rock is there and you can walk straight across? I know that CBP and CBSA are very concerned about that. And likewise, if you cross at one of these very small crossings in the prairies uh, where there's no radiation portal monitor or any of these other high-tech stuff that exists at the big quarters, um, there's more of a concern about how well is the border performing its barrier function at some of those little crossings? But, but I would just say communities are really key, and we have to have a flexible policy. I mean, Hyder, Alaska, they only have one garbage disposal in two countries, and they have you know, nearly one school district between two. It's, it's, it, we have to appreciate the community aspect of these local situations, and it, it's, I think it... It, it's really important that we make that case for um, the flexibility. Because DHS, when given the opportunity, that's the problem with Witty is it just lowers the boom, that's it. Nobody can make a distinction, even when they know very well who this person is. And I think we're, we're, we're all going to see unintended consequences. Um, and, you know, I'm trying to, you know, I hope that we can pre- we can see them out in advance, like the, the Nexus first responder we're trying to do, where, you know, at Point Roberts, where to go to the hospital, you have to go through two borders. It's, you know, and it's, we, we have to have systems in place that, that think through what's going to happen when we don't have flexibility uh, in the border. At Port Huron Bridge, they have a list at the, at the bridge of all the first responders in case there's an emergency but if the right guy isn't there or you know we need to institutionalize this so that first responders can cross uh, you know if the border gets closed we have an option for nexus first responders can get across some something like that anyway there's a lot of ways we have to rethink how our communities function I I'd just like to add my two cents, my 30 seconds to your question. We, we did attempt to get um, at that kind of variation when we looked at growth, you know, we looked at 
truck traffic, bus traffic, pedestrian traffic, and personal vehicle traffic. Um, but that is, you know, again, publicly available data. I am not, I'm not saying that data on uh, the number of individuals who cross on the Mohawk Reservation and data on the number of individuals who use boats um, to cross, which is, you know, huge in my neck of the woods as well, aren't available. I, I'm not, I'm just, uh, I've never seen that publicly reported. And so we were constrained in this, in this uh, first iteration by using strictly publicly available data. But it does beg the question, what, what kind of data should be examined? What should be the performance indicators? What are people looking for? I think that involves more than uh, the Border Policy Research Institute and the University of Buffalo Regional Institute engaged in this enter enterprise, as we suggest in the border barometer. Really, it will involve you know, the public sector, the private sector, and the academy coming to the same table to hash out some of the questions that we raised. Thanks. Um, and I guess with that, we'll open it up to, uh, to, to the floor. Is there anyone who did not ask a question this morning who's just been itching to ask a question who'd like to raise their hand so I can call on them? Please. <laughs> yes. I'm Steve Beningo. I'm with the Bureau of Transportation Statistics of the U.S. Department of Transportation. I'm wondering, do you have any goals in mind for border wait times during the Olympics at Linden, Sumas, and Blaine? And also, do you expect the waits at Linden and Sumas to be less so than what, will, what you're projecting for Blaine? Well, cer certainly, I, I think that anything over uh, 30 minutes is is something that we uh, we should is is unacceptable. Now that you know that's that's my personal opinion. <laughs> I've talked a lot with Michelle about that, um, and you know I think there are. The, I'm delighted the IT reader boards are in there, so you can choose your your border crossing. But um, Alder Grove uh, could be open longer hours, and it's it's not scheduled to be because of the. Uh, anyway, that's a minor point, but uh, it's going to be a, an issue. So I would say 30 minutes. Yeah, for our part, we haven't set any kind of goals like that in this exercise. We see that as more of a policy issue for other stakeholder groups to think about. What is the target? What is the goal? Um, with respect to wait times, CBSA and CBP are implementing a strategy of attempting to do some traffic diversion over to Alder Grove, Linden, and Sioux Mass. You heard Michelle James talking about putting in additional booths there, et cetera, and particularly on the southbound, getting back into the U.S., where Peace Arch will not be done and will have only four lanes. They definitely want people to divert to the Pacific Highway Linden Alder Grove Sumas crossings, and that can only be accompanied, I believe, by you know, longer, m more queuing over there than or ordinarily would be the case if traffic was just left to its own devices. So um, that's part of the strategy is to push traffic to those ports. And, and one of the strategies is to try. To, we are trying to get it into the GPS, um, get a real-time GPS thing, so the. You get a rental car with a GPS, it, it'll just take you, you know, one way. And we want to be able to impact that during the Olympics with real-time information. Thank you. Uh, any other hands? Sure. First of all, I want, I want to thank all these speakers. This is, a, I think, a, a benchmark meeting. This is the first time we've had a really coherent metrics at work. We still don't understand the impact of all of the information you've given us, but at least I think it's a benchmark study, so I want to congratulate all of you because we've been talking about this, Mark, uh, Matt and I, for years about how do we keep track and how do we get, I, I think it was a clock we were talking about at one time, Mark, and, and now we're talking, about, Matt, I should say, and now we're talking about a barometer, but I don't care what it is, it's keeping track, and, and that's good. 
Um, a cosmic uh, a comment and then some spe a specific question. Cosmic comment is seven years ago, the two-way traffic between Canada and the United States was leaping ahead by 10% a year. We're up to about 180 <coughs> million two-way trips a year, back and forth. It was quite an incredible number and growing by leaps and bounds. The latest statistic I saw, and people correct me if I'm wrong, it's now down to about 120 million. So in effect, we're down a third in terms of two-way traffic, and that, that's families, that's nurses that work in Windsor and, and uh, cross and back and forth. So we've had a di diminution, and then the most recent statistic we've just heard uh, from, uh, from Transport Canada is uh, delays are down, but traffic is down too. Ab absolute traffic is down. So the question I have for the Olympics is uh, what I, I guess Mr. Daly and, and uh, Matt is obsessed about, and that is where are the pain points? We know we've heard two. Uh, one pain point is the train issue. That's a pain point, and that's readily done with a few bucks. Uh, the other pain point is construction of plazas along some of the choke points. That There, there are alternatives to that. Oh, tell us what uh, the other pain points are, because my sense is that the Van Ock chair was right. There are going to be massive delays. And there are going to be, I mean, it's, it, the odds are there are going to be delays. And the question is, what can we do in the next 360 days to reduce the delays? And I think it's going to be, uh, I can, I'll b make a prediction, half an hour ain't going to happen. It's going to be much more than that. And it is going to impact on the games and uh, on tourism, not just for, for British Columbia, but, but for the region. So what are the other pain points so we can take that message back to our political uh, leaders to say, you've got to address this. I'm from Buffalo, so I cannot answer your question. <laughs> in points in Buffalo, Buffalo, New York, uh, uh, Stratford, the, not Stratford, but uh, the, um, uh, uh, the um, Shaw Festival is down about a third. 67% of the revenue that Shaw derives is from uh, the United States. It's down a third. One of the reasons are uh, lags on the border. We know that. That's a direct impact of the border, uh, not porosity, but lack of porosity. The same with Stratford. The same with the wine country in northern New York State. It's down because they can't do tours across the border back and forth. So it doesn't matter where you go, there are economics downturns and spin-offs. So the question is, where are the pain points? And how can we address them? I'm going to give you a little bit of an unintended consequence pain point uh, response here. And it's already uh, it's underway now or has actually already happened in the past. We heard earlier that uh, a fair number of infrastructure projects on roads and border crossings were advanced and funded because of the political impetus gained from Olympics. We, we know the Olympics is coming. Ah, finally then we can get the funding to do the Douglas reconstruction, to do the Peace Arch. Well, in fact, the pain's going on right now. Um, Peace Arch today is four lanes, and the city of Blaine and the city of Bellingham that count on border crossers for a large part of the retail trade, they actually are suffering today because right now the, the folks up in the lower mainland know that Gosh, it's bad trying to go south through the Peace Arch right now with only four lanes open, and they're not going in as big numbers. So, uh, and that actually has happened in other places because there's been work on all three of the border crossings in that area over the prior three, four years. So the pain's been shifting around from Linden to Sumas to Blaine and, and has been ongoing. So it was that kind of pain, I believe, will be over by the time the Olympics arrive because of this push to have everything done by then. Um, I, Hugh Conroy still here? Yes, Hugh. The Whatcom Council of Governments uh, did a pretty good little analysis. I wanted to credit you guys of looking at how many people really would be traveling on I-5 trying to get across that border during the games and this is the source of the oft-cited reference of really not a lot worse than a summer peak day. And, of course, some summer peak days come with hour-plus backups, don't they? So, uh, or a couple-hour backups. 
but the the analysis done by Hugh at the COG uh, was a very conservative one that assumed really high numbers of tickets would be sold in the U.S. and uh, a, a high high ratio of people coming from the U.S. Um, it's not clear that the numbers will be as high as predicted even by the COG. So I think, Hugh, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I believe that you think that your analysis is kind of a conservative one of what the worst case might be. Um, beyond that, we know that with Douglas northbound right now, they've got their 10 lanes built, and they have two of them with Nexus booths, and they, as a pilot now, are they're picking some peak time, heavy travel times, like a Saturday evening, people trying to come back into the lower mainland from Washington State. And they're deliberately manning it, all 10 booths, to see what's happening. And they are finding um, sub 20 minute wait times at peak times right now with heavy volumes. So a fair number of people who have looked carefully at the t ticket sales and the transportation aren't thinking it's going to be a nightmare, um, and I'm among that crew. So that other pain of the economic fallout that's happening last year and the year before and right now, that's going on right now in Whatcom County. I, I, I mean, the, the public transportation for me is a big deal. I can't get anyone at Van Ock or in the province of B.C. to seriously look at how do we get buses, trains and public transportation in through the border. This is great frustration to me. We already know that Van Ock will not allow you to drive your car to Whistler. The road is closed. So the, the, the lower mainland is going to be clogged with cars. We don't want more cars there. But no one's dealing with how do we get buses across the border in a seamless way. And I, I, you know, I, I'm just amazed that uh, no one's tasked with that. Uh, so that, for me, that's a, a pain point. I think there's, there's a great deal of, of opportunity there, and we wanted to have it done when ticket sales went online. So we know when a person purchases a ticket, they get, here's how to come in without, we know where they're from, here's how to get transportation. If you're coming from SeaTac Airport, you can get on a bus and go, you know. But we're, we're late at getting that information to consumers. We have thousands of people that we could still communicate to in time to leave your car behind or park it in Bellingham and take the bus. Um, yes. <laughs> I'd like to, as, as <coughs> Katie said, take this to the more 30,000 level again. Sorry. <laughs> um, and. It sort of pulls in everything we've done. We heard this morning uh, about good relationships and how um, people work together to get stuff done, and the governor talked about how she worked with the premier and other people. We heard a little bit about the challenges, not necessarily which challenges needed to be overcome to do that, but is the Pacific Northwest a model for the rest of the border? I mean, part of the um, what we've talked about in this conference is the sort of what the Pacific Northwest has done well, how Penware was great. I mean, Jerry told us there ought to be more like it in other parts. Um, maybe there should, but is this a model? I mean, if are there problems there? Are there something that's specifically great aside from relationships that can be put elsewhere? Or are the different parts of the border so specific to what they are as some of David's slideshow and um, what you spoke about in the, um, in the Windsor, Detroit area? Can we take those elsewhere, or do we need to really look at each thing region by region and hope that it's going to work? Well, I, I, I do think it's the model. I, well, it's, it's the, Penware is the, the uh, model of success for the f federal governments on both sides of the border and state provincial governments working together. I mean, I know in my neck of the woods, it's always looked to as the prototype and referenced as the prototype when trying to get policymakers at various levels of government in New York State and Ontario together to the same table to talk about issues. Now, uh, we were talking about this earlier um, at lunch. There, there are a whole host of different reasons, I think, why Penware has been successful and why um, th that kind of, of entity has not 
gotten off the ground in other binational regions. Um, lack of political will. Some people would argue um, culture. Uh, some people have argued that there's there's something about the Pacific Northwest being away from the centers of power in Ottawa and Washington. There's um, there's more, and, and this isn't you know there's there's just more of a do it yourself sort of mentality. So some people have argued that. Um, I, I I think it's the model to be looked to when when thinking about binational governance, but it may not necessarily work in other regions. And I think you have to take the. Pe the peculiarity of other regions into account um, if they are if they want to embark on the sort of binational governance construction um, it's it's a tricky business and I, th I think the lesson from Penware is that you need that political will behind that on you know political will on both sides of the border in order to make this successful I mean start you guys started in 1989 with some you know the Pacific Northwest Legislative Council or something like that. I may be getting the name wrong, but um, you know, there's a long history there, and 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 there was a policymaker um, uh, on each side of the border who got it, who understood how important it was. So I think I think those are the critical ingredients. Um, other hands back here, please. Hi, uh, I'd like to. Uh, applaud the data focus of today, and particularly uh, this last panel with uh, David and Catherine. And I was very interested in uh, what they uh, identified as the results side of the border, uh, that is, uh, the drugs and the firearms. I was very interested in lunch that uh, the governor mentioned uh, the terrorist uh, issue and said that there's only been one terrorist uh, uh, as a result of border control, is, and so I'm interested. Is that is that actually the the case that all of this thickening of the border has resulted in us capturing one? Well, now maybe it's it's prevented a lot, but isn't um, that an issue that should be talked about when you talk about challenges? Uh, that's we've talked all day about the process. Try to improve the process, but what's the process for? It's for some results. And isn't the result that has <coughs> caused the thickening of the border uh, risk? There's a famous uh, scientist or, or uh, author, uh, Waldowski, who said that there's, it, all risks require two uh, choices, uh, resilience and prevention. And if you look at uh, this issue of the border, we've been tipping quite strongly to prevention. Is it time now to, to, to step back and say, well, results-wise, and that's why I'd be very interested in, in further analysis, as you have done, of the border barometers uh, about drugs, uh, firearms, and terrorists, that the results seem to suggest that we don't need to thicken the border, that actually the results may suggest that we could dilute the border and be more resilient as many of these smaller local decentralized area uh, border areas are, and the result is that people are still safe. Uh, so I'd be interested if anybody has any views on that. By the way, were those was the data for one year like the three, the three uh, uh, ten million for drugs? Is that one year or all the years or what? That was CBSA for one single year out of their agency performance report. For all of for all of CBSA's ports, land, sea, and air, in in North America. Well, I guess that's yes. the only place they have ports. <laughs> yeah. The you've touched on something that interests us at the Border Policy Research Institute because it touches a little bit upon how I started my comments, which is, what is it that is the function of a border? Uh, and a huge number, for instance, of well, and I, I kind of tried to make a little bit of a case that what needs to happen at the border are the things that relate to differences in policy between geographic dis jurisdictions that abut that border, where the border is the place where you have to deal with that, like firearms. Uh, if there are big policy differences between the two nations, then there's a legitimate reason why Canada needs to think about that at the border. Um, whereas a huge amount of what's going on at the border right now has to do with things that aren't border-centric at all. So uh, 
local jurisdictions all over the border in the U.S. side are burdened with what they'll call border bounce backs, that um, U.S. citizens caught at the border with a roach or three grams of drugs, et cetera, at a, at a level that's so low that the federal authorities have no interest in prosecuting this person. But nevertheless, an arrest just got made. Something has to happen with that person. Uh, it's an arrest statistic, then, that shows up in CBSA or U.S. CBP statistics for that year. Ah, we made an arrest at the border. Uh, or serving a warrant for a failure to appear in traffic court in Oregon somewhere that has sat on the books for years and then gets discovered at the border. Those kinds of things um, don't need to be going on at the border. Uh, warrant serving for failure to appear and drug interdiction, and I mean, drug confiscations, et cetera, those are nationwide in both nations and aren't really border-centric. So um, we actually are beginning to look at some of those issues and uh, really believe that some of the thickening that's gone on is with functions that do not have to be present at the border and could be done elsewhere. So that's one way of responding to your comment there. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, read it. I just read that somewhere. <laughs> oh, thanks. Any other? Uh, any other hands? Sure. Steve Beningo again from the U.S. Department of Transportation. To what extent are the airports prepared for the 2010 Olympics, both the Vancouver International Airport as well as SeaTac? And have they been involved in the planning processes regarding transportation for the Games? A little bit, yeah. Uh, certainly they have, and uh, the ports uh, have been very in engaged in planning. Um, I think, you know, YVR, they've invested tremendously in in infrastructure there, and SeaTac uh, is quite aware of uh, of the games. I think there there's always more you can do, but but I think that uh, um, we are, um, you know, concerned about the um, the number of, uh, of connector flights and so on from Seattle. Uh, I think that a lot of people, the U.S. market will fly through Seattle because it's cheaper uh, to get to Vancouver generally, and a lot of them would like an opportunity to get up through the border without flying, and um, so we still need work on that. But um, certainly the, the ports have been really looking at this and have met with um, CBSA and CBP, um, so I, I think there's good cooperation. And on respect to the issue of uh, capacity, we, our institute, did look a little bit at that issue, just looking back at YVR's own documents declaring what kind of capacity they have to get passengers through their facilities. And our conclusion was that the peak travel periods are at the front end of the games and the back end of the games, when uh, a whole bunch of people all have to show up within just a couple of days. And at, at those two chunks of time, it seems real clear that there's going to be the need for other regional airports, Abbotsford, SeaTac, the other commercial airports, to be handling some of the load. People won't be able to book everything through YVR at either end. And then it's a more steady state through the games, and then uh, not as much of as a burden and not so much of as a need for spillover into the other regional airports. We are concerned about uh, CEOs of corporations and, and uh, heads of state that want to take their small planes. And, and that, you know, I know that Vanock's working on that, and and Sukumar's department is working on that. But that that could be overwhelming, the number of small jets that want to fly into Whistler, or that, that should be easy. Small it, it needs to be because there won't be capacity, likely. Uh, Thanks. Uh, if I could throw in one, one other question that occurs to me. I wonder the various things that you all are measuring and, and, uh, and issues that you're thinking about, would those things be any easier if we had shared border management? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm going to say that right now in the Pacific Northwest, there are IBET, uh, an integrated border enforcement team, and IBIT, an integrated border intelligence team. So there's some wonderfully integrated management of those kinds of issues of criminality trying to get across the border. So that already exists, and my answer is they've probably got great data, but I sure never get to see any of it. Um, so it's more the institutional thing that certain kinds of data generally do not get promulgated out into the public arena for us to be able to look at. And it doesn't seem to matter whether it's an integrated group or whether it's the two agencies stand alone. <coughs> Stump the panel. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, David. Uh, any other, uh, any other hands? Yeah. Oh, don't be shy. Yeah. I'm ready to do well, my wrap up. Well, remarks. and we'll have a wrap up from Matt. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, first, I'd like to really thank uh, this panel and. And thank David Biet at the Woodrow Wilson Center for uh, this hosting this great symposium. And also uh, Scotty Greenwood of, of CABC and Don Alper and David at the uh, Border Policy Research Institute. Um, it couldn't have happened without uh, all of our combined effort. Um, in, in a quick review, you know, I think <coughs> what we saw here from uh, Congressman Larson, tremendous investment by a state and province on an international issue, uh, taking a real leadership. Um, Minister Lunn, friendships do not happen by accident, uh, that this is a timely meeting. Cindy Gillespie gave us a, a great vision of how incredible the experience is of the Olympics and, and what a great opportunity this is. Uh, uh, Dr. Parawell really uh, hit on relationships matter. It's the continuity of relationships that build trust and the importance of a customer-oriented approach uh, to border management that involves and engages border communities. Uh, Hugh brought up the incredible value of, of an organization like IMTC in convening public-private stakeholders on a re regular basis in a multi-jurisdictional and binational forum. And uh, Don asked us, how can regional solutions impact national policy? Uh, I think Ted Alden, um, you know, borders seen by some as the best way to control threats, uh, as a dominant theme in, in uh, some of our U.S. agencies. Uh, Chris Sands brought up uh, his three recommendations, and I'd like to really highlight for me the third one, which is we need to develop a process to rebuild a joint vision of what kind of border we want. And this is not a small task. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort and a lot of uh, stakeholders and a lot of organizations. But in the, in the wake of the February 19th bilateral summit, we should be about that effort. And that will inform everything else we do. So, so I, I can't commend more highly. For me, that's the number one takeaway from today, is we've got to focus on how to build that consensus of what kind of border do we want and build a joint vision uh, about, about that. That's, that's extremely important. Uh, Chris also said, you know, be very precise with particular issues and solutions. Give port directors flexibility, decentralize. And Kelly Johnson's big idea, <laughs> Kelly, that was great, to establish a new joint U.S.-Canada Border Commission and concurrent with witty implementation, move customs processing away from the border. Brilliant and very common sense. And uh, we need to put some effort and horsepower behind uh, this big idea. Um, Michelle James, $700 million in the stimulus package will go to new infrastructure for land ports of entry. Uh, including staffing levels being increased. We need to inform and, and work on that process of where that's going to go. Great opportunity. Governor Gregoire, long-term commitment to work together to address the critical issues of the border to our shared environment and economy. And uh, Senator Grafstein, importance of institutional frameworks and transforming the way we look at our shared border. And, uh, and then uh, 
the important work of our academics at measuring border for performance and what are the questions that we need to be measuring. Um, I think all in all it's been a really great day and, and um, it's only successful in that we uh, really take away and move forward uh, with next steps and I think that you know for me it's it's the states and provinces that are the laboratories of innovation um, and and we have great opportunities um, to take you know what I hope and and certainly pray will be a very successful 2010 Olympics that uh, c can really uh, be studied as as a model of how to engage states and provinces in the border file uh, that I think is is going to be right in line in a timely look at creating that shared border vision for the new administration. Um, I'd like to again thank our um, our federal officials on both sides of the border. They've been extremely uh, willing to share and to work with us and you know out where I am in the Northwest uh, we just have uh, really fantastic people to work with and uh, it's been a, a totally uh, a great pleasure to see the professionalism and I, I you know I our border you know we we joked about getting the CBSA guys to take the super host uh, uh, training program which all the tourism you know professionals in Vancouver are doing and and um, you know Michelle James has a charm school that she's uh, <laughs> putting her uh, people through and you know our border people can smile and be tough and be a welcome uh, they are the point of entry and they are our first uh, you know and I, that's my hope and my goal that that we build a camaraderie around our, our our professionals at the border and we appreciate them when they are professional and they are friendly and you know I've heard from them I talk to them a lot um, they think all they hear about is complaints <laughs> You know, and we need to find a way to reinforce professionalism and f friendly professionalism. Um, I think that's so important. But you know, we're so lucky that we do have uh, such a great relationship, and we do have uh, the history of 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 a great border, and we can get you know move forward to a, a shared border vision. So I, I commend everyone for your involvement today and s staying right to the end. This is impressive. Uh, <laughs> so um, I really uh, also want to mention that David has mentioned that this uh, entire day is, is going to be webcast. So if you know colleagues that missed the day, they can go online and see it or any part of it. And uh, uh, David is happy to link in PowerPoint presentations and other data that might be of <laughs> value to today's conversations. So please the handouts. send them. Uh, yeah, oh, all the handouts. Excellent. Send them to to the uh, the Canada Institute here, and we'll have a repository of of good information. And let this be a beginning, not an end. Uh, we've got. 12 months to the Olympics and we've got a uh, fantastic friendship to uh, safeguard and our economy depends on how we do this together. So thank you very much on behalf of Penware. I'm, I'm very grateful for everyone's um, participation.